Now, before I start my talk, um, I need to decide exactly what I'm talking about. Um, we still don't have anything here, which is interesting. Absolutely nothing. Okay, I'll, I'll wait for a minute and hope that something's going to happen. Um, as no doubt you're doing as well. Um, so, um, I'll ask you a question instead. Um, now, um, I have plans to talk about basically a pure category theory, the foundations of dagonomoidal category, Fabulous <coughs> algebras, the underlying theory of categories themselves. Um, this was before I was entirely sure what the makeup of the audience would be. Now, Bob has since assured me that everybody here is interested in that, and would like to hear me talk about that. But really, I'd like to put this to a vote. So, my computer's deciding for me because it's actually hidden one of the talks. Um, okay, so the question is, who would like to hear about the foundations of category theory? What's the other option? <laughs> 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 okay, who would like to, would like to hear and talk about comments with circles? Okay. And who had a good night last night and doesn't really care what to talk about as long as I do it quietly? <laughs> Okay then. <laughs> Lika, we are there almost. Okay, so um, before I start, I'd like to. Um, uh, well, I should acknowledge some contributions of Philip Scott from the University of Ottawa here. Now, people who don't know me, I, I'm a theorist. Now. Being a theorist, oh, no, 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 no. yes. Being a theorist, um, I get to make assumptions, and one of them is that I have a quantum computer. So, the starting point for this talk is if we, if we had a quantum computer here, what could we actually do with it? Um, now, the reason I'm asking this question is that quantum computing has got a bunch of very general-purpose techniques, things like quantum period finding, um, growth research, in particular growth research for fixed points quantum counting, combining Rose's operator and um, Shaw's algorithm. And the question is, what can we do with these? And also, why is it so hard to find useful applications? Because we've got a few quantum algorithms, but not actually that many. Despite this, we've got some very nice general computing principles. So, why is it so hard to find useful applications? Well, what I'd like to look at is not how, not how quantum algorithms work, because asking that question is a surefire way to start a lot of it. Let's just look at what principles do they follow, what do they look like. So, this is what I tell students. A quantum computer, the input to it, is actually a classical computation. Then it performs some quantum magic, which is a technical term explained in the rest of the course, hopefully. And then it returns some global information about the classical computation that you gave it. For example, is it balanced or is it constant? What's the period of it? Where are the distinguished points? That kind of thing. Okay, now the natural question then is how can a classical computation be an input to a quantum algorithm? And the simple answer is it's input as a quantum volume. So, of course, these are unitary maps that, when applied to the computational basis, look classical. They map basis vectors to basis vectors. And as I comment here, they are very tedious to construct. This. Um. <laughs> okay, so getting into a bit more detail, let's say we've got a classical reversible function. Now, if we've got some bit string, we can make a vector B, a computational basis vector B, or a computational basis vector FB. Now, an oracle for the classical function F is simply F lift to the quantum setting. So we take um, a classical reversible function, and we apply it to our computational basis vectors. Okay, well, sounds simple. Why do we want these? Or what's the key point about them? Well, they're unitary maps, so they're linear, of course. Absolutely, the key point that we want for our quantum algorithms to work 
is that they take the superpositions of inputs to the corresponding superpositions of outputs. If they don't do this, you've got absolutely nothing. This is the key requirement for what we need. Okay. Now, there are complications, of course, because in computing, we need ANSYS. And it's from the Greek for servants. Um, it's an additional register that it plays a part in the computation, but because we don't want any unwanted entanglement, it's got to start and finish in the same state. So the theorists have spent all week telling you how to construct entanglement. Here I'm saying, actually, sometimes we're trying to get rid of it. So, how do we create them? That's the question. Well, here's the usual approach. Um, we implement F classically, and we do it using reversible binary logic gates. And of course, we don't have any loops, we don't have any feedback, and any extra memory, any extra bits, they've all got to start and finish in the same state. And then we just go through, and each of these elementary reversible logic gates we replace it by its quantum counterpart. Now, um, I and I know other people here um, have had a previous incarnation as a commercial computer programmer. And if someone came to me and said, could you implement a large problem in this paradigm, there's only one thing I'd say. Um, I'd say, well, how much are you offering? Because it doesn't matter how much you're offering, I would not take on that sort of thing, because I don't like to take on jobs where you know that you're not going to arrive at a solution. The problem is, people don't think this way. Well, okay, I mean, maybe if someone's going to resurrect Johnny von Neumann, then, okay, some people have thought this way, but most people do not think this way. Um, the problem is, this paradigm rules out all the things that we know and love as computer programmers. Feedback, conditional iteration, recursion, fixed point architectures, the von Neumann architecture itself. This has ruled out all of those things. So, um, building oracles is not simple. If you look at Shaw's paper on his factorization algorithm, um, most of the paper is taken up building the central oracle. It's actually a very, very, very simple algorithm design. We've got our central oracle here for modular exponential differentiation, and this is conjugated by the quantum Fourier transform and as far as the quantum part of the algorithm goes, that's it. There's our classical computation turned into an oracle as the input, and there's our quantum Fourier transform. Okay, well, um, are there other ways? How about using Turing machines? Because we've all heard of the quantum Turing machine, um, introduced by David Deutsch back in 1985. And, well, we also know about the criticism of it from John Myers. Um, where he asks, can a universal computer be from quantum? That's the title of his paper. Now, he spends a bit of time saying, in a very elegant and devastating way, no, it can't. Um, here's the problem. Now, by fully quantum, he means preserving superpositions. So, if we look at a quantum Turing machine, we've got a state space instead of a state set. Um, now, we can have superpositions of states, of course, which means we can be in a superposition a starting state and a halting state. And the question is, what happens after halting? With a classical Turing machine, it's simple. After halting, you're done. Here, we can be in a superposition of halting and non-halting, so what happens next? Well, okay, there was a significant contribution from Wilson and Vazirani, and they say that if your quantum Turing machine, if the number of steps to halting is fixed, then that can be fully quantum. And then, one year later, there was a claim by Zauer that says arbitrary quantum Turing machines can be made to take start states to halt states in a coherent manner. Now, is Sandhu about today? He's not. That's a shame because this is really one of my favourite quotes from a paper where he criticises Zauer's scheme with this rather beautiful phrase that it's not fully halting except in the case where it never halts. Ouch. <laughs> Okay, now next year, Azawa published a rebuttal of Linton and Pescu, and the same year, this was shown to be incorrect by Q and Danos. Now, I'd like to point out this all happens in the space of a year or so, and all of these things are actually published, which means they're accepted, they're looked at by the editor, they're peer reviewed. So, this is, this is a very subtle point. Um, 
But there was one thing in common with all, with all of these solutions, and every proposed solution relied on an ancilla. And in every case, this ancilla would at some point become entangled with the output. Right, okay, well, we're sort of getting away from the aim of actually doing something here, so if we're going to define oracles, which model of computing are we going to use? Well, not Turing machines, that's not going to work. Alternatively, circuit model, well, we know this works, but then we know that this is impossible. I mean, not impossible in the halting problem sort of sense, but just impossible practically to do anything particularly complex with. So what I'm going to suggest is, well, let's look at not Turing machines, but a very simple bound of their interface. Um, and my claim, the third point here, is that we, we have a translation from their computations into the quantum circuit model. So this is a process of compilation. We go from a higher level to a lower level. Okay, now I'm going to do some formal definitions here, but they're kind of simple. So these things are pretty much like Turing machines. We've got alphabet symbols, a set of labels, a tape, and a transition function that tells us how to get from one state to the next. Just one tape? Sorry? Just one tape? Just one tape, yeah. Though the multiple tape case is equivalent. Now, unlike Turing machines, the tape is going to be a fixed finite length. And as a simplification, every label we have is going to be called either left moving or right moving, and we're going to position the pointer between the cells on the tape. So, here's the dynamics. Well, we've got a pointer position between cells. This is going to move onto a cell, so it's going to move onto the cell to its left when it's left moving, onto the right when it's right moving. That's all. Okay, so it moves onto a cell, then the transition function gives us a new symbol and a new label. This goes onto the tape and onto the pointer respectively. Okay, <coughs> then, well, we're going to move back to a cell boundary. It's going to be the left boundary when our new label is left moving, and the right boundary when our new label is right moving. Okay. And of course we're going to deal with the notion of state, which is a complete instantaneous <coughs> description of how the Turing machine looks, bound to Turing machine looks. Now, we don't need to define halting because we've got a built-in notion of halting. So you stop when you don't know where to go next. So if you're, if you're on the far left of the tape, and you're in a left moving state, what do you do next? You don't know if that's your halting state. Or alternatively, the same on the right. Um, we've got the dual concept of this. Um, we've got a starting state, which is when there's no possible previous history. So when you're on the far right of the tape, with a left moving label, or vice versa. Okay. So here's an example, just to kind of clarify. We're going to take the notion of alphabet kind of literally here. We have an equal set of left moving and right moving labels. And, well, we write our problem on the tape and we let it evolve according to the transition function and we move backwards and forwards <coughs> over the tape, changing the label and symbol as we go until finally we've replaced our problem by our solution. Now, for people who are looking for funding, I thoroughly recommend product placement in the talks. <laughs> okay. Now, what this does, this defines a partial function that takes starting states to halting states. But when our transition function is reversible, well, this function is a bijection. It's an isomorphism from starting states to halting states. And this is the aim of our talk. We want to produce a quantum article for this bijection. And we want to produce this for use in things like period finding or Gropus search or any other of our general quantum mechanical principles. Okay. We've still got a problem, what happens after halting? So to summarily answer John Lai's question, there's only one possibility. After halting, the only thing you can do if you want universal dynamics is to reverse the operation and go back and uncompute what you've just computed. So a machine with, with starting halting states is going to be transformed into something with entirely cyclic behaviour. Okay, so exactly the same thing. We go back over our tape, reading and writing as we go, this freezes all not going to be happy. Until we reach a halt state, at which point we flip from forward gear to reverse gear, back over the tape, reversing, undoing the computation that we have just done until we arrive back where we started. Okay, well, you can look at this and you can think, what, what's, what's the use of this? Um, 
Now, the key idea behind this is that quantum computers, they can't deal with conditional haunting, but they're remarkably good at dealing with signal behaviour. And what I'm going to claim and demonstrate is that by transforming conditional haunting into cyclic behaviour, we can indeed build quantum circuits that compute the function computed by the of Turing machine. Okay, well, of course I'm going to do this in binary, so we're going to map our states of the the bounded Turing machine to binary strings, and we're going to use the most significant bit to demonstrate whether we're in forward gear or reverse gear, whether our dynamics are going the way they should, or whether they're going in the reverse direction. Okay, well, so this is what it looks like. Each state is mapped to the next state, and here's our forward moving direction, here's our reverse direction, and you can see, instead of starting with halting, we just transform this into loops. <laughs> so, here's the exact problem. We've got an oracle for the step-by-step -step evolution of our space mounted Turing machine. Okay, um, if we don't have that, we have nothing. And what we want, we want an oracle for the function computed by the bounded Turing machine. And we want this as a quantum circuit. So, how are we going to do this? Well, <coughs> I kind of lied when I said this talk wasn't about pattern theory. Um, at the same time, um, <coughs> it's an application of category theory, so um, it's like a building. You have the scaffolding there when you put it up, and then you can sort of take it away afterwards, leaving everyone wondering, how did that get up there? So, if at any point I appear to be pulling the rabbit out of the hat, it's simply an application of category theory. So, I'm going to take something that's called the resolution formula. And this came out of logic to start with. It is, of course, category theory, and it's also very useful for looking at state machines. So, here's a computational description of it. So, we start with a binary string whose most significant bit is zero. We repeatedly apply P, and we keep doing this until the most significant bit is again zero. And this is going to define a function on the strings whose most significant bit is zero. Now, of course, a picture's worth a thousand words, so this is what it looks like. Let's take the picture we had before. We've got our forward moving and our reversed behaviour. And we apply the resolution to get a new function that looks like this. Now, if anyone's interested, this is an example of a categorical trace. The reason I haven't called it a trace here is that instantly we're going to be confusing this with the usual trace of Hilbert spaces, which it isn't. It's a trace in a different category, but satisfying the same formal axioms. Okay, so this is what, what it's going to look like. Um, we take our starting state put an additional zero on it, we apply the resolution of P, and we're going to arrive at our halting state. So, the question is, can we give an explicit formula for this? Yes, we can, otherwise the talk finishes now. Can we translate this into a formula for the oracle? Yes, we can. Um, and can we give quantum circuits to compute exactly this? Yes. So, we're going to get the outcome, which is an oracle for this bounded Turing machine. Okay, well, a little bit more mathematically, here's our bijection acting on our set of states, complete with our additional flag for telling us whether we're in forward or reverse gear. So our oracle is going to act on the space with its basis. And of course, the basis set can be divided into two equal subsets, which means that the space is going to be split up as the direct sum. We call it R and F for reverse and forwards, obviously. And what we can do now is we can write our step-by-step -step evolution as a block matrix. Okay, so, here's <coughs> our um, Everybody's familiar with, with drawing matrices and stochastic graphs, like this. And, well, for the resolution, we just take the directed graph of the matrix, and we add in an additional loop from forward, from forward to forward. So, what's going to happen is we're going to sum over all the paths there, and we're going to get this thing, just here. Slightly wrong given the formula, but not terrible. Okay, now, here's some standard results on this, and these do come from the category theory. Um, I gave this talk once to a group of algebraists and analysts, and they insisted on deriving this, all these results via algebra and analysis, and they were happy by the end of the talk, but I think they've missed the rest of it. Okay, so it's well defined. It's an infinite sum, but it converges. Um, it's a unitary map, and final point, it's an oracle for a classical computation. So it's going to map basis states to basis states. Okay. 
now it's time to start building the circuits. Um, hopefully not too much of this will look like pulling the rabbit out of the hat. Um, if there's any points where we can, um, you're not happy, I'm going to do explicit matrices, so feel free to do the matrix calculations. But I promise you that the category theory is a lot simpler. Okay, so what, what are we going to need in terms of quantum gates? Well, we need the oracle for our primitive evolution, um, and we've got our distinguished qubit that tells us whether we're going forwards or backwards. And we're going to need some basic arithmetic, really basic arithmetic. We're going to need the successor map, modular overflow, of course, and we're going to need a cyclic shift. And that's almost it. We're going to need control gates as well, of course. So everyone knows about control gates, so I'm just going to skip over this, including how to write them in terms of block matrices. And control 1, 0, control 1, 1, okay, everyone knows this stuff. Now, of course, control gates can be controlled. We can have multiple controls or multiple qubits. So, if we're controlling on 0, 0, this is our block matrix. We're controlling on 0, 1, it's this. And you can see the pattern of our block matrix simply moving down the diagonal two steps at a time, like this. Okay, so that's all we're going to need. We're not even using most of the things out of the circuit model. So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to modify the oracle for the primitive evolution. So, every time we apply it, we're going to apply a not gate just up here, and we're going to flip between forwards and reverse gear. This is going to happen every time we apply it. Um, if people are familiar with game semantics, they'll understand, of course, where this idea comes from. So, here it is. Um, now, when we draw a matrix for this, all we're doing is flipping our matrix like this. Okay, now, as an, in, as an input, well, we need an ancilla. Um, this is log 2 of the worst case one in time. And, of course, we need a starting state for our bounded Turing machine. So, this is how it works. First thing we're going to do is apply a knot to our forwards gear, reverse gear qubit. And that's what's happened so far, not very much. Okay, then we're going, then going to apply a series of, of controlled maps. So we're going to have this controlled on all zeros, and we're going to have the same thing, but we're going to conjugate it by the successor map. So instead of moving two steps down the diagonal, we're moving one step down the diagonal. And then we're going to do the same thing, we're going to move two steps down the diagonal, again using the control map. Same thing, conjugated by the successor, three steps down the diagonal, etc, etc. Okay, now we keep doing this process, and what do we get? Well, this is where I say, if you want to do the calculations, feel free, and it's easier through the category theory. What we get is this matrix. Now, the important thing to notice about this matrix is that formula that I called the resolution, you're going to notice the individual terms of that building up in the columns as you go along. There we go. So, what's the effect of this matrix practically? Well, we've got our starting state, and it's mapped to a halting state, and we've got our ancilla, and our ancilla is telling us the number of steps that the computation takes. Okay, so this hasn't got us anywhere so far. Um, this was the problem that um, John Moyers was complaining about in the beginning. It's not what we wanted because, well, if we try and trace out the ancilla, we lose our coherence. So, what we're going to do next? Well, we're going to repeat this process, but instead of using the oracle for our step-by-step -step evolution of our bounded Turing machine, we're going to use its inverse. And, of course, because of the way I've set it up, it's got convenient form as a circuit. So, okay. So we flip the most significant bit, we apply our primitive evolution, and we flip it again. That's all that's going on. So instead of going forwards, we're going backwards. Okay, now this time we're going to carry on for two T steps, where T is our worst case one time. This is going to uncompute the computation that we've just performed. Okay, again, we're not getting anywhere really. Um, but what we notice is that this ancilla is counting the number of steps that we're taking. That's still increasing. So instead of that being mapped back, to zero, it's actually mapped to 2t, where t is, is the number of steps between starting and halting. Okay, well, what we're going to do now is we're going to use our cyclic shift just once, and we're going to divide this ancilla by 2. Okay, 
So we've got the number of steps into the whole team rather than double that. The final thing we're going to do, we're going to repeat the first section, but we're going to do it with the operations in reverse order. And the intention now is that we're going to redo our first computation with the ancilla decreasing this time. Okay, well we can do this by modifying the article for the point of evolution. Um, we have an explicit matrix for it, which as a circuit is pretty simple really. We've got the knot afterwards rather than before. And, well, instead of going down the diagonal here, we're moving back up the diagonal. And we're going to carry this on for two steps. So, okay, this is our overall matrix, and you'll notice, well, we've got our resolution building up, but it's building up in the opposite direction. And what this means in terms of the ancilla, well, we have the time taken between starting and vaulting, and to product our starting state. We carry on, the time taken is decreasing this time instead of increasing, and it ends up at 1. Okay, well that's good because 1 is, is fixed, it's not dependent on how long our computation state takes. As a very last step, we're going to use our knock gate to flip this 1 to 0. So, that's, that's all that happens. So, here's an overview of the whole process. Um, here's our ancilla. Here's our state. Starting state, well, we do our computation. We reverse our computation with the ancilla still increasing. We divide the ancilla by 2, and then we redo the computation, but with the ancilla decreasing this time instead. Of course, we take 0 tenths of the start state to 0 tenths of the whole state. Okay. Now, what about superpositions? Because this was the key question. Well, if we run this procedure, starting with superposition, yep, the ancilla starts and finishes in the same constant state, regardless of the input. So it's not actually entangled with the, the result of the computation. So we do indeed have a genuine oracle for a space-bounded Turing machine. And, well, that's about it, really. Um, so, one last point. Um, Shortly, um, someone's going to say, does anyone have any questions? Now, there's a question that someone absolutely should be asking here, and if no one else asks it, I'm going to ask it myself, and then answer it. So, okay, over to you. Do you want to start off? No, 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 there no, 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 It's, it's linear in the time step, and the ancilla is the log of the worst case time. So if my u is a 2 to the n dimension, so the t will be 2 to the n? No, 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 no. The, the size of u doesn't really matter. Of... It's, it's simply the, the worst case number of time steps before termination. So that means that your oracle construction is always polynomial? I mean, it's always constant in your building? Um, I mean, this is confused. So I'm giving you okay. Some of this UI, I know that is exponential, and hard to simulate, some of them are polynomial uh, simulation. Because some you is implementing exponentially hard problems, some you some are implementing some polynomial problems. Um, you are implementing exponentially hard problems on a band of two So, 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 okay. so, first of all, your model is supposed to be universal, or it, uh, it doesn't aim to be it, it doesn't aim to be universal, no. I mean, so, the whole point of Maya's paper was that you can't combine universal and coherent. So, so then it's aiming to construct oracle which are already within the class, for example, PQP. So it's already targeting a particular subclass that we know they are efficient. Um, what it's aiming to do is to um, construct an oracle um, which is classical on a computational basis. So talking about BQP is never here and there, I think. Please explain to me, the thing is, could you just say what the expressiveness of bounded Turing machines is? <laughs> with um, reversible, with reversible yeah. transition. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say, but you know as well as I do, but that's, that's an undecided yeah. question. Yes, okay. Yeah. But I mean, so, so uh, context sensitive. And is it exactly context sensitive? That's, that's also, I believe, an undecided question. And that's with yeah. reversible, uh, so reversible dynamics is already, it still takes it to complex sense. I believe so, yes. Yeah. This doesn't really still answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so let me start from the basics. So in the circuit model, if you give me a classical oracle, if I know how to run it, the forward f, and I know how to run the uh, inverse f, then I know how to construct my oracle. And also in the constant. So what is this, 
offer more in compared to that? Um, this is talking about constructing the oracle. This is about how to construct the oracle. So that's, that's also constructed. You give me a classical uh, oracle which implements the function f directly and uh, the f inverse directly. That's the Bennett scheme, the old scheme, but how do I construct the quantum oracle for that? Yes, yes, no, that's, that's not the question. The question is, let's say we're given some function f, and we define a set of starting states and a set of pointing states, and then we repeatedly apply f until we move from the start subset to the whole subset. That defines a new function. And the question is, how do we build an oracle for that new function? Ross, so, Ross, no, sorry, sorry, I shouldn't be choosing you. Go ahead. Ross. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... Because there's no need for this Bounded machine to actually ever reach all these things. Yes, there is. Yes. If you start with starting states, um, you will eventually arrive at the pointing states. So I can make my control step left, step left, step right, step left, step right, step left. No, because that, that violates the universal dynamics. This is a theorem of Samson. out a step in your procedure okay. uh, because it looked to me like you were doing a computation when you were undoing it. But at some point I guess the input had to change or something like that. Uh, no, you undid your computation, sorry, you did your computation, you undid it, and then you read it. It was just the answer uh, was running in different directions at each time. So there were three yes, things yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I should have labeled this really. But yeah, this this is our computation. That's an computation, and that's our recomputation, and it's just minor inputs and the inputs. Uh, so what is the question? <laughs> <laughs> You've been hanging around with the logicians. <laughs> the question that I'm expecting people to ask, what is the question? Okay, um, well the question that really should be asked at this point is, um, can you actually build any new quantum algorithms with this? This might be a sort of impolite question, it's a bit like asking an experimenter whether they've built a new quantum computer yet. Um, now, the quick answer is no. Uh, the long answer is no, and that's a very, very interesting thing to me. Um, so, 
how are we doing for time? Mm, yeah. Can I explain in three minutes? Yeah, at most. Okay, now what I've been doing is taking, okay, Shaw's algorithm here is a general form of quantum theory find. So what I'm doing is looking at replacing this this oracle for logical exponentials with something built from this system in order to find the period of functions. But there is a problem um, in that um, Dorit Aronoff, Zeph Lando, and Mikowski proved that the quantum Fourier transform, <coughs> this part, um, has what's called a low bubble width circuit. Well, that means that this part and this part are classically simulable. And if what you put in the middle here is classically simulable, then the whole lot is classically simulable. Now, we don't believe this holds for modular exponentials. We, we rather hope it doesn't, but it does hold for other things. Now, the things that I've been looking at, been constructing, um, actually, I've been discovering low bubble width circuits. So, you put them in here, and it becomes a classical algorithm rather than a quantum algorithm. But this is a really useful thing, because it may be a classical algorithm instead of a quantum algorithm, but it's still significantly faster than the naive way of doing things. So what this is telling us is that even if we never actually build a quantum computer, um, the principles of quantum programming can still be used in theory to speed up classical algorithms. Now, um, the particular examples I've been looking at so far, they're of course toy examples, but this seems like a, a very interesting possibility here. So does, I mean, is one way of saying it that you have a class of quantum circuits efficiently, classically supported? That was, that should be the case because there is a result of Richard Joza and John Matros that showing bond of the space quantum computing is classically simulatable. That should be exactly the same. I mean, not exactly, but it's not exactly class, the same, but it, it, is, it is related, class, yes. yes. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's not exactly the same because, of course, um, modular exponentiation can be implemented in bounded space. So, given enough ingenuity, you could build a bounded Turing machine that computed your modular, modular exponentials for you. So, it's not exactly the same thing, but no doubt it's related to something. Okay, so, yeah, just, um, you know what I'm doing in February 3, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But does this sort of mean you could take the principle that you apply in the category that you're in and apply it maybe in other categories and you might get ways of improving computation? I certainly hope so. Because that'd be yes. very cool. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, on that positive note, uh, I think we'll <laughs> 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 <laughs>